Everything I just described is playing out and there's data to back it up, not just an inverted treasury yield curve, which is interesting. Well, two to ten is the main sector where it's inverted, but even more profoundly in the euro dollar futures curve. Yeah, you know, I, I call the treasury yield curve a short term bet on a long term rate. The euro dollar futures curve is a long term bet on a short term rate because the euro dollar future is it's like we're betting on what an overnight rate is going to be two years from now so like a long-term bet on a short-term rate and it's inverted and it shouldn't be inverted that should never it does happen but it should not happen well yield curve should be upward sloping just because time value of money and uncertainty etc if i lend for two for a longer period of time or make a further forward bet i should get a higher rate well how come people betting on overnight rates a year or two years from now think that rates are going to be lower? And that shouldn't happen. The only explanation for that is we're going to go into recession. It's going to get a lot worse. But, but going back to um, a really important distinction between a recession, even a bad one, and a financial crisis, because they're two different things. They, they can come together. But for example, in 1998, we had an acute financial crisis and with long-term capital management and I negotiated that bailout, I had front row seat on that one. But 1994, um, the tequila crisis um, and there was a, the bond market massacre. There have been these financial crises, but there was no recession in 1998. In fact, the NASDAQ went to, it went to the moon. We were looking, we, long-term capital, we were licking our wounds after the meltdown and you know turning on cnbc and like watching pets.com the sock puppet and all these things are, they're going to the moon like hey, we just got wiped out but the but the opposite is true you can have a recession without a financial panic uh 1990 we had you know kind of a mild recession yeah. it, there was no financial panic then uh 2020 was interesting i don't know what to call it i mean technically a recession but the economy drops 31% annualized in, they say two quarters, first and second quarter of 2020, but it was really two months. I mean, if you break it down, it was March and April. They, they happened to fall in two quarters and took both quarters negative, but it was really two months, down 31% in annualized in two months, and then up 35% by the right. third quarter. I mean, that was crazy. So maybe that's technically a recession, but that's, well, that's just what happens when you shut down the economy. But there was not a financial panic. Stock market fell, but the banks didn't fail. You know, nobody's lined up to take the money out of Citibank, et cetera. So you can have recessions without panics. You can have panics without recessions. October 19th, 1987, Dow falls 22% one day, no recession. But sometimes they do go together. In 2008, they did. We had both. We had an honest to goodness financial panic. Uh, everyone knows, you know, Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Lehman, AIG. But uh, I, mean, I can tell you, and I've spoken to a lot of people, Morgan Stanley was days away. And then Goldman would have been behind that, probably City, and um, yeah, maybe JP Morgan would have been the last one. And the economy collapsed and the stock market fell well over 50%, I think 60%. So that was an example of both. And what I'm concerned about is we may be heading into both. For everything I said about what's behind the curtain, the plumbing of the financial system, acute dollar shortage, scramble for collateral, which leads to deleveraging, because if I can't get the collateral, I got to take the trade off. Deleveraging of balance sheets, et cetera which are the early warning signs of a global financial panic and a likely recession. We could very well be looking at a severe recession and a global liquidity crisis, two different things, but they could converge. We've got to give a little credit to Robert Schiller. He wrote a great book called Narrative Economics. Now, narrative is just a fancy word for a story. It's like, okay, you can call it a narrative and it means a lot of people buy into it, but it just means there's a story that people believe. And this goes back to uh, the greatest sociologist of the 20th century, Robert K. Mert. There is no Nobel Prize in sociology, but if there were, Robert K. Mert would have won it. But he's the one who came up with the phrase, the self-fulfilling prophecy. And the classic case is you wake up in the morning, the bank's fine, but somebody gets nervous and they run down and take all their money out. And somebody sees them and go, what are you doing? So I'm getting my money out of this bank. Okay, I better get my money out too. And everyone's like, I don't want to be the last one out. Next thing you know, there's a line around the block. And by the end of the day, the bank shuts its doors and they're bankrupt. But they weren't bankrupt at nine o'clock in the morning. It's, it's because a story spread. Uh, people believed it. People acted on it. And that's the key. Do you act on the story? You can make the thing you're worried about come true even though it wasn't true when the story started. Narratives can be true, but they can be false. In other words, a completely false narrative can be extremely powerful if enough people buy into it. The Fed pivot is a narrative and it went like this. So 
Inflation takes everyone by surprise in fall, late 2021. November 2021, Jay Powell says, time to retire the word transitory. And then inflation goes to the roof. The stock market goes down. It's still going down. But then after the Fed raised rates, the, and then the yield curve is inverted, uh, the narrative is like, well, wait a second. The yield curve inversion is telling us that rates are going to be lower months from now. Inflation's cooling off a little bit, and it has. And so they're going to have to cut rates. That was the pivot. And rate cuts are good for stocks, so buy stocks. But then we get this rally, and the stock markets, you know, we're covering a lot of this, not all the lost ground, by the way, but, but a lot of it, all based on the Fed pivot narrative, which I never bought into. I mean, I, you don't want to stand in front of a moving train. I wasn't going to short the S&P. I did not buy into the narrative. I said for, for two reasons. Number one, oh, inflation came down from nine. Well, that's nice, but you're, you say you want to get it to two. You're a long yeah. way from two. And how much demand destruction, how many rate hikes, uh, how much do you have to do to really destroy the economy to get inflation down to two? The answer is a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. And tell me why that's good for stocks. And it's not. But the other reason is, and this is a little more sophisticated analytically, but just because the yield curves are telling you that market pros think rates are going to be lower, it doesn't mean the Fed's going to cut. That is the message, but it doesn't mean the Fed's going to get the message. How many times does the Fed get things right? The answer is never. The, the buy the dips crowd have not gone away. They're still around. The uh, I'll say talking heads, uh, I guess I'm one, but you know, the, the cheerleaders, I'll put it that way, uh, the Wall Street cheerleaders have never gone away. The Wall Street always wants to sell you something. The um, people who think the Fed knows what they're doing, there's some of those. But the fundamentals have not changed. Forecasting the consequences of Fed policy is really difficult. But forecasting Fed policy is the easiest thing in the world because they tell you what they're going to do. But the hard part is, is what's going to happen as a result of that. And the Fed's thinking, Maybe hard landing, but not too bumpy. Uh, and I'm thinking more like a plane crash. Not to get too geeky, but I, sometimes I can't help myself. There's something, there's a concept. It's, it's not that difficult. It's called DBO1, which is the dollar value of one basis point. And what it means is if interest rates go up, uh, you know, whatever, 25 basis points, what's the change in the price of securities? Uh, and that's what's the, the, you know, the rates up, prices down, rates down, prices up. That's just bond math. But, but it's not uniform or linear at all levels of rates. So when you, at higher rates, the DBO1 is lower and at lower rates, the DBO1 is higher, which means the impact of every basis point increase in interest rates is greater uh, at lower levels, right? So uh, in other words, raising rates from, uh, I'll just say two to four for a range, is much more damaging to prices than going from uh, 8 to 10. A much higher interest rates, a whole different world. But the impact of that on bond prices is less than going from 2 to 4, where it's like you're just putting these bonds in the seller. And that plays out in derivatives world. So that's another factor, uh, along with scarcity of collateral, you know, shortage of dollars, uh, you know, quadrillion dollars in notional deleveraging balance sheets and a, and a higher DBO1 meaning these interest rate hikes do more damage per basis point to bond prices than if they were at a higher level. That's definitely cause for concern. The, um, you know, whatever your baseline is, probably treasuries, you know, to your notes or five year notes or whatever, they will come down a lot, not right away. It's, we may still be a month or two away from, on this, but they'll come down a lot. The uh, interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates be um, you know going up if we're in a recession. The answer is, um, as you get close to recession, who knew, who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, um, or even medium-sized businesses. Um, they see it, uh, uh, you know, if you're in the trucking business, it's, it's real time. Uh, you know, if inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed, you're not, you're not moving anything by truck. Uh, so there are certain businesses that are concurrent. But the, the stock market is saying, uh, yeah, the Fed's raising rates, inflation is coming down, but we think they're already at the terminal rate. But not only that, we think they're going to get the memo that that the Fed will figure that out uh, before they 
get to five and a quarter before they raise rates in May, maybe even March, you know, maybe they're done. Um, and because of a recession, uh, this is the soft landing Goldilocks scenario where the market's right, the Fed's wrong, but the Fed will realize that the market's actually right and cut rates, you know, and if you're going to cut rates, buy stocks. That's like Wall, Wall Street always ends every analysis with buy stocks. So here, here we see Wall Street in real time kind of bidding up tech stocks because the Fed's going to pivot and cut rates. Um, when in fact, Powell's thinking, no, that's not happening until 2024. So that's what the Fed thinks is happening. Uh, the market thinks that Powell is over tightening, that inflation will come down faster and the pivot will happen sooner. And that's why we've seen a little bit of a rally in stocks recently. So, so you, you have the Fed narrative, that's plan A. You have the market's version of what the Fed's actually doing, which is plan B. My estimate is that they, they're already past the terminal rate. They don't know it. They don't think so, but they are. And as I said, inflation is going to come down a lot faster than, than anyone expects. Um, I talked about how the Fed is blundering because they're raising rates too high, too fast, etc. And they are. But the Fed has always said, we don't worry about inflation. We don't like it but we know how to get rid of it. We just raise rates and maybe they got to raise them longer and further than people expect. And maybe it's painful. There are costs involved, but they can kill inflation just by raising rates. They don't know how to stop deflation. I mean, how do you stop deflation? You can't raise rates. That'll make it worse. You can go to zero, but, but that doesn't, once you're at zero, you're at zero. QE doesn't work by the way. It's been tried to the tune of like $9 trillion, but the the empirical evidence is that it's just, you know, they, they, they do QE by buying bonds from the banks and the banks take the money and give it back to the Fed as excess reserves. That money never goes to the economy. What good does that do? And the answer is it doesn't do any good. It's a triple, greatest bubble of all time, times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks and, and other asset classes. So uh, yeah, I do, uh, that, that is my view, but it's, it's shared by a number of other analysts. If all that's happening, and the fundamental signs are also weak, which we just saw in third quarter GDP, which is based on net exports, which won't last. How, how are you going to drive a trade surplus with, with the strongest dollar in 20 years? Good luck with that. I mean, nobody can afford our stuff and we're not buying anybody else's stuff. So with the economy going into a recession on its own, with a global liquidity crisis brewing, why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? There are two different things, the global economy, is is the big topic that's what we all care about most but financial markets can come up with their own narratives and go their own way at least for a while so you have to they're not in in sync they they do they will be in sync eventually but uh, not always right away a lot of times the financial markets get ahead of themselves and then they wake up to reality and they oh crash you know correct down so in terms of the global economy um i think your use of the word global is very much on point because it's often the case that you know you look around the world you know you've got the united states or you know north america if you want to throw in canada you've got the eu you've got china you've got japan they're all important economies but they can kind of be in different uh parts of the business cycle and it's not unusual for one part to be in recession but another part of the world is like doing better so that these the uh, phrase locomotive theory you know the locomotive is going to pull us all out of the ditch you know and, and we'll get going so it's not unusual to have recessions in the united states or europe or particular countries in europe or japan i mean japan said nine recessions since 1989 i mean nine uh, i consider that one long 30-year depression that's that's a debate for another day but i would just that's how i would describe japan but it, it usually um you know one's not doing so well and another part of the world's doing better uh that's not the case what is happening right now i see it but there's a you know an awful lot of data to back it up is that we are going into or may already be in a global recession so the global economy is in bad shape uh it's going into a recession now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal, but they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession based on, based on a lot of factors, some of which we, we've spoken about. Now, the other half of your question, which is, you know, important to listeners is what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. 
and I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality, what's actually happening. So the Fed story kind of goes like this. The, the Fed, uh, you know, forecasting what the Fed's going to do is the easiest thing I do. It's because it's not because I have a crystal ball or I'm smarter than anyone else. The Fed actually tells you. All you have to do is listen and believe them. Now, a lot of people don't listen or they listen like, oh, the Fed will never do that. They, they will. They actually mean it. You know, Japan had the famous lost decade. Well, the lost decade was 20 years ago. Started in 1990 through 2000. Japan's now almost at the end of their third lost decade. The United States has had a lost decade from uh, 2007. Uh, we're probably, if something doesn't change, either in terms of policy or a collapse, something gets worse. But absent that, uh, we're going to remain in this kind of punk 2% growth as far as the eye can see. You know, people say, oh, well, you know, uh, second quarter GDP, Atlanta Fed predicts, you know, 4.5%. Yeah. But we've had four and five percent quarters in the last nine years. They don't last. You get these spikes. You get a real good, you know, four percent print, and then the next quarter is two percent. The one after that is zero point five, or maybe even a negative quarter. So the headwinds, demographic, technological, productivity, psychological, etc., haven't changed, and there's no reason to expect they'll change. So you can't understand debt in isolation. You have to understand debt relative to income. And that debt to GDP ratio, which is something I spent a lot of time looking at, you know, the, the GDP is kind of chugging along, not going up very much, but the debt's going like this. The debt to GDP ratio is getting worse. Uh, looks like the problem is people don't understand what diversification means. They think if they have 50 stocks in 10 sectors, semiconductors, consumer non durables or whatever, they're diversified. And what I say to them is, yours, you may have 50 stocks, but that's one asset class. You're in stocks. And in stressful situations, they become highly correlated. So you're not getting the benefit of diversification. You think you are, but you're not. So what does a diversified portfolio look like? Well, I have a slice of stocks. I'm not anti-stock market, but you got to pick the sectors and the stocks that will do, that will perform well, even in the kind of conditions we're talking about. And I would go back to energy, natural resources, agriculture. So, you know, uh, a marathon, Exxon Mobil, Chevron, ADM, uh, Cargill, um, uh, you know, uh, mining companies uh and not just gold gold yeah but um i recently invested in a lithium mine uh i think i think <laughs> i think the the climate alarmists i think the I, I the green new deal i call it the green new scam uh, and it's a scam but it doesn't mean it doesn't have legs whether it's whether you like it or not the fact is uh it's going to go on so the lithium's in short supply uh graphite you know etc so there is a portfolio you can have which is natural resource oriented that will uh do well even in the kind of tough environment we're talking about slugger cash absolutely maybe as much as 30 percent i like treasury notes uh 10-year treasury notes but you know season to taste if it's, if they're a little too volatile look at five-year notes to your notes they're going to come down a lot not right away not tomorrow morning but um sooner than later because of everything we discussed which is uh you know a recession and interest rates will follow or lagging indicator but that'll happen um uh gold i always recommend 10 percent slice absolutely there's a hate to get too deep in the weeds in terms of bond math but there's something called a dbo1 dbo1 is the dollar value of one basis point what that means is you know obviously basic bond math interest rates come down the value of the, the price of the bond goes up they're just invert it's a little counterintuitive but rates come down the bond goes up the question is how much and the lower the interest rate the more the price of the bond goes up for every basis point drop in rates mm -hmm. so in other words if you go from nine percent to eight percent you'll have a nice capital gain on your bond but if you go from three percent to two percent it's still a one percent drop but you're gonna have a much bigger capital gain you know in, in each instance it's a one percent drop in rates but the amount of capital gain on the bond is much higher you know as the dbo one is higher when the rates are lower again it's all counterintuitive right. but the, 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 the lower the rate uh the greater the capital gain on each basis point drop that's the basically so yeah when you're you, you go from three percent to two percent that's a home run in terms of capital gains so you get the yield you get the safety, you get the liquidity, and if you feel like selling it, you got a nice fat capital gain. Yeah, but based on what we were talking about, get um, I I would get uh, uh, silver dollars, American silver eagles. Yeah, the monster box. Uh, you know, 
bit of jargon. Monster box comes from the U.S. Mints, Treasury Green, nice shade of green. It comes with a compression strap. I recommend don't open it, you know, unless you know, do, do not break except in case of fire. But inside are 500 one ounce American silver eagles. That's a lot. Um, they'll feed your family for, you know, probably a year. And uh, it, uh, um, they run, you know, it's a market price, but, uh, you know, be around ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 for a monster box. But to me, it's like battery and flashlights, you know, you just have one stick in a safe place. Yeah, I, I like them both. And, you know, I talk about gold a lot because it's a, a form of money and uh, I do the monetary analysis. Uh, I mean, I do invest in gold mines, but I don't hold myself out as a geologist, but I do think about it from a monetary perspective. And then people always say, Jim, what about silver? What about silver? I'm like, look, if, if gold soars the way I expect, silver's along for the ride. There's a, there's no, there's not going to be a world of $3,000 gold and $20 silver. That world doesn't exist. If gold's at 3000 silver's going to be pushing 100. So without giving an exact forecast, uh, silver will be along for the ride. Silver is a little more difficult to analyze because it has industrial applications. Gold really doesn't. Gold's not good for anything except money, but it's the best form of money. Silver can be, is used in a lot of applications. So if you have a recession, it's perhaps the case that the monetary value is going up, but the industrial input value is going down. So it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, but silver is going to do fine. And I do think it's extremely practical because in a world of CBDCs, silver will be a form of spending money. Gold, even the even the court, even the eight gram coin I mentioned, the quarter ounce American gold eagle, still five hundred bucks. That's like pulling a five hundred dollar bill out of your wallet. You know, it's it's a lot for groceries. Yeah, income producing real estate. I wouldn't get into commercial real estate, residential. Uh, yeah, the, the prices are you know um, home prices are coming down uh, a little more in some markets than others, but. Uh, if it's income producing and it's solid and it's a, in a place like, you know, uh, someplace people want to be like Austin or Phoenix or whatever. I mean, I know there, 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 there's markets down a little bit right now, but you know, it's like buying a, a 10 year bond, you know, it's got steady monthly income and, uh, or certainly farmland, uh, but in income producing real estate, not commercial office buildings should be a part of a diversified portfolio. Yes. I, I like private equity and it's, you know, you got accredited investor issues and uh, finding good deals and good promoters and good management. But, um, you know, that, that there are some, uh, you know, some good deals in the mining sector um, I like. Uh, ser seriously, everything we talked about is sort of pales in comparison to what's going on in Ukraine. We're kind of on a march toward nuclear war. If you talk about what they call legacy media, mainstream media, so Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, NBC, ABC, CBS, MSNBC, right. CNN, that run of characters. The first thing you discover is, I know a lot of these people, I've been on all these programs, I've done this for a long time. I spent a lot of time in Washington, I had dinner with most of the, or lunch or whatever, with dinner actually more often with most of the names you've heard about. Um, some of them are fine, some of them are nice. A lot of them are either not that bright, or, I mean, they're good on camera, they need, uh, or whatever, they got a desk at the Washington Post, they're not that bright. Or if they've got some degrees, they've been kind of indoctrinated. We're at the point now, uh, I mean, a lot of these people are 28, 33, 34 years old, There's nothing wrong with that. That's, you know, good, you're, you're in the heart of your career, but that means they graduated from school in, uh, you know, 2016, 2017 or whatever. Um, and they're thoroughly indoctrinated. Uh, I'm, I, I, um, I mean, I went to school when uh, uh, we, learned, we learned it was pretty rigorous. I mean, I, I had one program where the, they graded, you needed a C plus average to graduate, I mean, but they graded it on a C minus curve. So you're like, well, how do you get it? How do you, how do you even get a C plus if they're grading on a C minus curve? And the answer is people quit. And in, the, in other words, you were, you were trying to struggle to be, I did get an A in partnership taxation. And I'm proud of that. But my, the standards are down. The mission standards are down. Affirmative action takes over. When you get into the classroom, I don't care where you're at, you know, Ivy League, whatever, it's just indoctrination. The market has a way of sorting it out. I mean, if revenues are down, advertising is down, the viewers are down, subscriptions are down. Eventually, as you said, they will go out of business, not overnight. And then new media channels will arise. And, you know, there's a lot of garbage on the internet, but there's a lot of good stuff. And, um, you know, if you want to keep tabs on the war in Ukraine, you have to know where to look. It's not easy, but there are a number of channels with, and I'm talking about, you know, military officers, you know, colonels, you know, brigadier generals, um, 
people on the ground in Ukraine, not, you know, some studio in New York, you can find out what's going on. But I think my intelligence training is helpful because you have to be very persistent and know how to do it. We may have um, a very bad recession, possibly worse than 2008. So tell me why it's a buy signal for stocks if the Fed is throwing the economy into such a bad recession that unemployment is going to go up significantly and growth is going to come down and inflation is going to come down. Why is that a, a, a buy signal for stocks? Maybe at the bottom, you know, and the bottom might not be till late 2023. Okay. Yeah, there's, there are opportunities to, to buy the bottom, but we'll be nowhere near the bottom. Bear market rallies are, are really interesting. Some of the biggest rallies in history have been in the middle of bear markets where you ended up losing everything. But for a couple of days or weeks even, uh, uh, it's hey, the bottom's in, you buy stocks, et cetera. So you have, you have to watch out for that. So we're flying into a really bad recession. The stock market's starting to get the message, but you know, you've got this pivot narrative. You can't quite get rid of the, some of the buy the dips people are still around. So count on them to, you know, buy into a, what could be a horrendous bear market. Uh, you got your buy and hold crowd, you know, remember in uh, 2000, 2001, the NASDAQ dropped 80%. And a lot of people got out, but a lot of, they said, well, just hold on to it. Well, it did come back, but it took until 2015. I mean, it took, that's a long time. A lot of people died in the meantime. You know, you're waiting 14 years to get back to where you were. So, uh, so those people are still around, but there is what I call the pivot crowd. So the Fed pivot is a narrative and it kind of goes like this. Yeah, the Fed's tightening. We see that. Inflation is going to come down really fast. The economy is going to slow down really fast. Both of those things are happening. Inflation, a little less so, but the, the economic slowdown is there. And the Fed's going to get the wake-up call and have to cut rates. And cutting rates, that's the pivot. They're going to pivot from rate hikes to rate cuts. And that's good for tech stocks, so buy stocks. Now, that's the narrative. It prevailed in uh, late July and most of August. The stock market did go up. There was a, there was a decent rally uh, in the middle of what's you know, become a, a bear market uh, based on this Fed narrative that they were going to have to cut rates. There are two huge fallacies in that uh, in that narrative. The first one is, uh, who says the Fed's going to get the message? And if you look at what Jay Powell said and what he repeated, we're going to raise rates, we're going to crush uh, inflation. Uh, you know, I've been following this for 50 years. I've, I've never seen a Fed chairman use the word pain three times in one paragraph, but he did. Uh, and he meant it. Um, he knows there's going to be a recession. They're causing it in, in part. Um, Unemployment is going to go up. He said that. He tied unemployment to um, killing, you know, basically demand destruction and getting inflation under control. He said, we're, that's how we're going to do it. Um, and uh, you're already starting to see some early signs of that. So with that as their focus, who says the Fed's going to you know, get a wake-up call? Almost certainly not. I mean, they told us what they're going to do. They're going to raise rates. And then he said, if we see progress on inflation, we'll pause. But pause doesn't mean cut. It means just wait a long time because at that point, core PCE, that's personal consumption expenditure, core, which excludes oil and food, and that, that's just how they do it. That's their favorite metric. You can debate whether it's the best one, but it, the debate doesn't matter because that is the one they use. Um, that Let's say that comes down to around three and a half. Okay, it's still not two. Now, what Powell, which is their target, so what Powell said is, we don't have to keep raising rates to force it to two. We just have to raise them enough that it'll get to two on its own. That's what they call a restrictive, a restrictive policy. So, but that's not a rate cut. That's that he said that might last for a year, all the way into 2024. That's when he was talking about rate cuts. Now again, this, this can change, but but they've told us what they're going to do. I always say forecasting the Fed is the easiest thing I do because they actually tell you what you're going to do, what they're going to do. You just have to listen and believe them. Um, now the hard part is understanding how badly they're going to destroy the economy and when they're going to get the wake up call. That's the hard part of the analysis, but telling what they're telling you what they're going to do is the easy part because they kind of tell you. So, so the stock market notion that somehow they'll be cutting rates is just false. I, uh, yeah, I was around for the 2008 financial crisis. I was around for 1998 financial crisis. You know, I, I, I negotiated that uh, bailout for LTCM. Uh, 98 was interesting because it was a an acute financial crisis that came very close within hours, actually. And I was, you know, I was in the room with the Treasury and Italian Finance Ministry and 19 banks and you know, a thundering herd of lawyers trying to trying to save the world. But uh, we we came within hours of shutting every market in the world. 
there was a $4 billion all cash, you know, you, could, you couldn't use the word due diligence because there wasn't time. It was just, hey, the Fed wants us to do this, so let's just do it. Um, so, uh, so that worked. But um, it was it was you know it was a very close call. They would have shut down Tokyo and then around the world, London and finally New York. And yeah, they would have opened days later. But that's how uh, with trillions of dollars of losses, it would have been worse than what actually happened in in 2008. It didn't happen. But there was no economic recession at the time. That was and that's that confuses a lot of people because and particularly if you're if you're using 2008 as a frame of reference. There are, there are financial panics and financial crises and liquidity crises, and there are recessions, some of which are severe. But they're two different things. Uh, 98 was a finan- an acute financial crisis with no recession. Um, 2000 was a mild recession, but there was no severe financial crisis. Now, NASDAQ collapsed, but there wasn't a lot of leverage in NASDAQ. There was, there was no contagion there, but it didn't spread because it didn't, no banks, no banks failed, no major brokerages failed, etc. cetera. Uh, so, so in 1990, a mild recession, but no financial panic. Uh, October 19, 1987, interesting, stock market fell 22% in one day. Not a week or a month, but one day down 22 percent, and that was a financial crisis. But there was no there was no recession, uh, so they're separate things. However, they can happen together, and 2008 was an example. There we had both, but I would encourage analysts to separate those two things again. They came together; it was it was horrific, but um, but they can happen separately. My my point is. Uh, what's coming is a very severe recession. The uh, uh, you know monetary tightening uh, on top of a world where growth is deaccelerating, inventories are sky high. You know the funny thing about the supply chain, we all remember headline: you know supply chain is broken down. Uh, you know the, the shelves are bare. So well, all true that that was happening at the time, and that's when I uh, started working on the book. But what a lot of purchasing managers did um, and inventory managers, they they doubled their orders. They said, well, we're triple the orders. They said, well, if the supply chain's breaking down and I want just a normal amount, I better order three times as much or twice as much just to get what I want. And they did. Well, what happened was by the summer, some of that pressure had been alleviated. And here come the shipments into the warehouses that are twice as much or three times as much as what you needed at the exact same time that the Fed was destroying demand. And so demand drops off a cliff, uh, retail sales drop off a cliff, the warehouses go from being empty to being full to the rafters, and now all that merchandise is sitting there. So, uh, you know, Nike, I mean, just many examples. So what what do you do when you're um, in charge of inventory? You cut prices. You, You don't want that inventory. It costs a lot of money to keep it in the warehouses, number one. Number two, a lot of it's seasonal. It's like, who wants to buy, you know, summer dress in uh, December? And not too many people. Um, so they just slash prices, uh, and that reduces margins and reduces profits. So we're just kind of flying into the face of all that uh, with the Fed tightening rates into weakness. The, the Fed will be the last to know because they're very model driven and the models are badly flawed, mostly with the Phillips curve and their focus on the unemployment rate, which. Uh, is is not a good measure of um, of what's going on in the labor force. So my expectation is the recession is coming. It's going to be really bad. Um, inflation is going to come down fast, but not quite fast enough for the Fed. Uh, they're going to keep raising rates, destroying demand, raising unemployment. And we're going to wake up with a, a severe recession, high unemployment, and a much lower stock market. Supply chain is not part of the economy. Supply chain is the economy. And I was, if you want to understand the economy, you're you're really talking about the supply chain at every aspect. You know, something as simple as a, a loaf of bread. You know, you buy a loaf of bread at the grocery store. Like, okay, well, I guess it came from a baker, and I guess they took it from the bakery to the store by truck. So there's a supply chain. Well, that's about as simple a version of the supply chain as you can imagine. You have to just start going from there. I was like, well, did the bread come in a plastic wrap? or a paper wrapper. Well, that wrapper came from somebody. Where'd the truck come from? Well, obviously a truck manufacturer. Where'd the driver come from? Somebody had to make a career choice and and be trained. And what about the diesel fuel in the truck? You know, that that came from refinery and that came from oil exploration. Uh, Then you get back to the baker and it's like, oh, well, I guess he had an oven or she had an oven. You know, where did that come from? Then you find out that the ovens are 
you know, industrial ovens have parts from 25 different countries and, and so forth. Well, without belaboring that point, you get back to the farmer and the wheat and the fertilizer and, and everything else. And really what's called the extended supply chain. And you're like, wait a second, that's a huge number of countries, a huge number of imports and a big part of the economy, which it is. And then every link in that supply chain I described has its own supply chain behind it to get to source materials and intermediate manufacturing and so forth. And then that's for a loaf of bread. Well, what about your car, your furniture, your clothes, and, and, and on and on and on. Once you start thinking about what supply chains are, you realize it's just the cardiopulmonary system of the entire global economy. So, you know, the supply chain book shines a light on the entire global economic process. And I have whole chapters on that talk about China, the war in Ukraine, and climate change. And you say, well, you know, the interesting topics, what do China, Russia, and climate change have to do with the supply chain? Well, the answer is they are, you know, kind of global macro earthquakes. Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine led to sanctions against Russia that affect everything, you know, imports, exports, strategic materials, semiconductors, uh, fertilizer, oil, natural gas, etc. Again, you're saying, well, okay, Boeing makes aircraft, they need titanium and aluminum, where does that come from? Turns out about 30% of it comes from Russia. So how are you going to keep the Boeing assembly line going when you're shutting down strategic metals from Russia can go kind of on and on there. China, you know, everyone says, well, they slowed down because of the, the zero COVID policy. And that certainly has been detrimental to their economy. Shanghai, a city of 26 million people. Beijing, a city of 22 million people. They were both locked down entirely last spring. When I say entirely, you know, no transportation in or out, uh, nobody on the streets. You had some essential workers, people had to get to work. You had to have a COVID uh, test, a negative result uh, that was not more than two days old. Uh, so these were extreme lockdowns and obviously very, very detrimental to the economy. Um, now, those have died down a little bit and China's saying, now we're going to relax our zero COVID policy a little bit. So what's new? What, why are supply chains breaking down? Kind of what's new about the supply chain that makes it different than any other period in the history of the world? And what's new were, were two things, and they arose around 1989. The first was you had a combination of increased computing power, algorithms, artificial intelligence, better data collections, and new models. So you suddenly had the, the computational telecommunications and data and mathematical tools to be a lot more sophisticated about how you handle the supply chain. But the second thing that happened at the same time was 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1991, the uh, collapse, the demise of the former Soviet Union, which gave rise to new trading partners in uh, both in Eastern Europe, where they were no longer behind the uh, the Iron Curtain, you know, Poland and Romania and uh, Hungary and, um, and many other countries. And at the same time, you had the rise of China. China did have a fairly high growth period in the 1980s, but um, nothing like we see today. And it all came crashing down in 1989 with the T Tiananmen Square massacre. And that really shut down U.S.-China relations, not fully, but there was, you know, there was no, there was no Western investment coming into China. The two countries were distant. Well, that ended around 1992. Deng Xiaoping did what he called the Southern Tour, where he reaffirmed China's commitment to capitalist principles. They weren't overthrowing communism, but they were embracing capitalist market ideas. There was a thaw in U.S. relations. And then it was like, you know, no holds barred. Then then that's when the U.S. investment really did pour in. So, so all in a, a short period between uh, 1989 and 1992, um, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, new republics, China kind of re-enters the game, and all this, this was this was globalization. So now all of a sudden you had the science I described, you know, computing and artificial intelligence and applied math and a true global market. So now now the supply chains could go 9,000 miles from Chongqing to New York or from, uh, you know, Shanghai to Seattle or, you know, London to, uh, to, to Hong Kong, of course. So this was true globalization, much larger scale, much, much longer supply chains. And it worked. And so this was a period I call supply chain 1.0, 30 year period from 1989 to 2019. Now, why did it break down around 2019? 
three things. A lot of people look at the pandemic and they go, oh yeah, COVID, that disrupted everything. That was the problem. And some people look at the war in Ukraine and the Russian sanctions and go, that was the problem. And they both made it worse. They both made it worse, no doubt about it, made the supply chain worse. But it really started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs on China. So he put, uh, Trump put tariffs on appliances and solar panels. Well, China didn't stand still for that. So China said, well, what can we do to strike back? Well, at the time, China was and is the world's largest importer of soybeans. They need the protein. They don't have enough. The U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. Well, China was buying all their soybeans from the United States because they were trying to reduce the trade deficit. We were buying so much stuff from them. And China said, well, what can we buy from the U.S. just to kind of balance the books a little bit? And the answer was soybeans. Well, when Trump put the tariffs on, China redirected all of their soybean orders to Brazil. They stopped buying U.S. soybeans and they bought them all from Brazil. Well, there's a lot more to that than a phone call. You got vessels and dry bulk carriers and uh, transportation lanes and port facilities. And, you know, if you're Brazil and you get all these orders, you know, you got to get trucks to get the soybeans to the ports. You got to open up port facilities, et cetera. The point is, this is a major, major shift in global logistics just to change the order book from the US to Brazil. Beyond that, people involved in this, they don't want six month contracts, they want five year contracts or at least three year contracts and they got them. And so now all of a sudden, China's buying all their soybeans from Brazil, but this scramble of global supply chains. Now, what are the US farmers doing? We're still growing the soybeans, we can't sell them to China. Well, it turns out the Netherlands needed them. So, okay, we'll sell them to the Netherlands and distribute them to Europe, which they did. And then this went on and on because Trump put more tariffs on to retaliate. China took more actions against the United States, canceled purchase. So, and it escalated from there. Now, again, COVID made it worse, the war in Ukraine made it worse, but it, it's very clear that that's where it started. So that's why I use 2019 as just, you know, kind of an arbitrary date with a 30 year period of supply chain 1.0. Now we're getting to supply chain 2.0. But we're not there yet. We're in this like messy, in between, inefficient, muddling through period where things are broken, but they haven't, they'll never be put back together the way they were, but we haven't produced or created the new model supply chain. We're just muddling through and with a lot of disruption, a lot of empty shelves. You have to understand, it took us 30 years to build this. We blew it up in about three years. It's not gonna come back overnight. It's gonna take five or 10, years or maybe longer to rebuild in, in some form.
I would say that the Fed's monetary policy will fail or is failing, and fiscal policy will fail, is in the process of failing, even if gold didn't exist. If you didn't have gold as a, you know, multi-millennial monetary standard, even if gold wasn't there as a reference point, which of course it is, but these policies are failing anyway, and there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, whenever I hear, you know, fiscal stimulus, I say, well, no, the Fed can print money all day long and the Congress can spend money all day long, but don't call it stimulus. It's not going to have any stimulative effect. We're way, way past the Keynesian multiplier, which is now below one, meaning if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you don't even get a dollar's worth of GDP. You get some number, 70, 80 cents. They forget about the multiplier. It's actually now, uh, you know, a divide or something that uh, reduces uh, GDP. Well, you don't get the GDP for the borrowing. And same thing with uh, monetary policy, because uh, unlike uh, Milton Friedman, the monetarists, the New Keynesians, the Austrians, and everyone else, money printing has nothing to do with inflation. And they, they seem to, well, I don't know if they ever knew it, so I can't say they forgot it. So all the money printing and all the deficit spending will not stimulate the economy. And that's true anyway, but gold is signaling that. Look, all markets are try to be forward leaning. Some do it more successfully than others, more accurately than others, but they try. I was, I would say that, yeah, people say, you know, the stock market is an efficient discounting mechanism for future events, for what they see in the future. And yeah, they look into the future. Here's their forecast. They pick out a discount factor. They, they present value it and say, here's where, where stocks should be today based on where things are going to be, you know, six months or a year from now. And that's what they do sort of mathematically and analytically, except they're always wrong about the forecast. you, you got to get the forecast right <laughs> if the discounting process is going to mean anything. So markets go through the process, but they always get the future wrong. They, they're, they're not very good at predictive analytics. So um, this creates what I call the gap between the perception and the reality. Reality always wins, but not right away. Sometimes it takes a while. Gold, on the other hand, has very high predictive analytic value, number one. Number two, it's more forward-looking. So gold's kind of telling you where things are going to be maybe a year to 18 months from now instead of six months from now. And so, yeah, so gold is signaling that monetary and fiscal policy will fail and something will, else will be tried. Uh, and that ultimately will re, you know, result in a much higher price for gold. So gold's just saying, well, let's do it now. You know, look, I've got gold at $15,000 an ounce by 2025. If I'm wrong about that, it'll be sooner and higher. But that's, yeah. well, I consider that a conservative forecast. And we can maybe take a few minutes to go into the analytics behind that. As I've said before, you've heard me say, I don't, I don't just throw numbers out there to get attention. I don't really care. I do care about getting the analysis right. There's a number of different techniques. And what's interesting is they all point in the same direction. So, so, you know, it's got to go to 3,000 before it gets to 15,000. It's got to go to 5,000 before it gets to 15,000. So that's my kind of long range forecast. But, you know, it could go down tomorrow. And I'm like, I don't get depressed when it goes down. I don't get euphoric when it goes up. I know where it's going in the long run. That's the important thing for if you're trying to preserve wealth and make money. You know, nothing wrong with making money. I'm all for it. But, uh, but sometimes preserving wealth. Yeah, risk aversion is a higher priority than just making a lot of money in the short run. But uh, either way, gold will serve that purpose and, uh, you know, and preserve wealth over that, uh, over that time period. Could it go down tomorrow? I guess, yeah. But all the vectors are pointing up, uh, very strongly. And I'll give you a, a concrete example. There are three things that drive the price of gold fundamentally. Uh, one that you've already mentioned, which is real interest rates. The lower the real interest rate, the higher the price of gold. Number two, supply and demand. You know, you learn it in your first three days in economics, but it, it still works. Uh, and then uh, number three is geopolitical risk. You know, call it risk off or fear fact, whatever you want to call it, but I, I think of it in geopolitical space. Those three vectors don't all have to point in the same direction. You could have a situation where geopolitical risk is high, pointing to a higher gold price, but real interest rates are, are really high, and that would point to a lower gold price, et cetera. Small ebook, big impact, the wealth tree. The only four ways that will make you financially free forever. Download it here for free. But right now, all three of them are flashing green or maybe flashing gold. The uh, real rates are coming down. Uh, they're still high, by the way. Uh, when, when I, I always have to just roll my eyes when uh, the really smart people uh, 
Dan Isaacson, uh, Bill Gross, uh, Jeff Gunlock, and I admire them all, and I, I, I follow them all. But they've, they've all been carried out feet first on this, you know, bond bubble thing, you know, the greatest bond bubble in history, and short bonds, and the interest rates have nowhere to go without. They're, they're just failing to distinguish between nominal rates and real rates. Nominal rates are low. Real rates are not low. When I say low, I mean, show me negative 4%. That's a low real rate. Yeah, you can pick your notes or, or your bills or whatever, but I usually use the 10-year note rate, a 10-year treasury, because it's a good proxy for building construction, long-term investment. People don't borrow overnight to build a building. They borrow for seven years if they can, et cetera. So to me, that's my proxy for, for sort of economic growth and, and inflation forecasting. That's uh, it's what, about 70 basis points today. Etc. But inflation is, you know, one, one and a half, uh, take your index. So that puts the real rate, you know, maybe negative 25, negative 50 basis points. Well, thank you very much. But yeah, I remind people 1980, I borrowed money at 13%, but inflation was 15%. And my borrowings was tax deductible. And the tax rate, I lived in New York City at the time, was 50%. So my real after tax rate was about negative seven. That's a low real rate. So the point is, we have a long way to go. And um, it doesn't matter, you know, people are interested whether the Fed's going to pursue a negative interest rate policy, take the target rate on Fed funds below zero. Legally, they could. It's already been done in Europe and Switzerland, Japan, a few other places. I don't necessarily forecast that. I don't think the Fed necessarily wants to go there. But you can have negative yield to maturity on a 10-year you note. Just whenever the premium is greater than the present value of the coupons, it's a negative yield to maturity. So you can get there. You can get deeply negative rates in secondary market trading, regardless of what the Fed does. And that will happen. And so, you know, the DBO1 dollar value of one basis point is higher as the absolute level of rates gets lower. That's just, you know, duration, just bond math 101. So we're going to have huge capital gains in 10-year notes as the yield to maturity goes, you know, towards negative 1%. But that's going to be an enormous boost for gold. Uh, we're not, we're not even there yet. We're seeing these, uh, we're seeing kind of a spike in gold prices when, they, when real rates are still, you know, relatively high. They're only mildly negative. I was declarative when I said printing money does not cause inflation and it doesn't. Uh, again, I'll just use the last 12 years as, as exhibit A. I wish probably relate to the viewers what does cause inflation. And the answer is velocity, the turnover of money, the lending and the spending. But the problem is velocity is a psychological phenomenon. The Fed can stick the landing on money supply. They can get it down to a couple of decimal places if they want. But if you want to control velocity, which is the key, that's psychological. So, so what you have to do is change the psychology. Well, what is the psychology right now? It's deflationary. Uh, the savings rate in May was 33%. You know, it had, it had been going up. It kind of made its way like from 4% to 7%, but then it spiced to 33%. Well, savings is a good thing. You can drive an economy if you can convert savings into investment. And furthermore, if the investment is productive, unlike what China's doing. Uh, but I was, we got some infrastructure or some other projects, R&D that, that, that would be productive. That can drive an economy. You don't have to drive an economy on consumption. You can drive an economy on productive investment. But the problem is twofold. Number one, it, it has a much longer time frame. That's a five, seven year time frame. And it comes in the short run, at least at the expense of consumption. Our economy is driven 70% by consumption. If you substitute savings for consumption, you're killing velocity. Because if I put my money in the bank and leave it there, but the velocity is zero. And I remind people $5 trillion or $6 trillion times zero is zero. You can print all the money you want, but if you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. And so the question is, how do you how do you change the psychology? How do you get the? And by the way, it makes sense to say if you're unemployed, you better be saving because you're maybe lucky if you can pay the rent. Uh, but even people who are working or still have their jobs, they're worried. Maybe I'm next. You know, maybe they fired a guy down the hall, but maybe I'm next, and maybe I better save more just in case. You know, and so forth. So, and that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that doesn't make sense. That makes a lot of sense. But understand what it means. It's deflationary. It reduces velocity. It offsets the increase in the money supply. And it's very hard to get out of. I mean, you know, Keynes called it a liquidity trap and he was right. That's what it is. So how do you change the psychology? Well, you need. The bond market is telling a completely different story, by the way. And, and this is a little more esoteric. Uh, but, uh, if you look at, um, yield curves, Look at the treasury yield curve, euro dollar futures yield curve, German buns yield curve. They're all inverted. 
they're all inverted. Now, inversions happen, just meaning the longer term rate is lower than the short term rate. We're seeing something globally we've never seen before. And it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good, Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's gonna get the memo, they're gonna cut rates, the pivot and buy stocks. The bond market is saying no. This is bad and it's going to get worse and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. See, when these inversions start, sometimes they're a year forward, like, hey, look out, look at the Euro dollar futures yield curve a year from now, man, that thing is inverted. But what happens is as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or, or, or less. So that's like a, you know, a big red siren, a flashing light, whatever you want to call it. Okay, the um, you know, whatever your baseline is, probably treasuries, you know, to your notes or five year notes or whatever, they will come down a lot. Not right away. It's, we may still be a month or two away from, on this, but they'll come down a lot. And then corporate yields will go up a lot because of the recession, because of deterioration, increased bankruptcies, reduced revenues, you know, et cetera. So those spreads will blow out. And it's important to remember um, interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates be um, going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, as you get close to recession, who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, um, or even medium-sized businesses. They see it. Uh, you know, if you're in the trucking business, it's it's real time. Uh, you know, if inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed, you're not moving anything by truck. So there are certain businesses that are concurrent. The yield curves I was talking about are very good forward indicators. They tell you what's going to happen next. A lot of business people are living in the real world in real time. They know what's happening now, and the stock market tends to figure it out later. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. Be like, hey, there's a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the terms. I said, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits and the bankers go, huh, what's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then, then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards. They stop doing loans. And then interest rates will start to come down. Interest rates peak after the recession has already begun. So interest rates may not have peaked yet. I mean, you know, even the treasury market. So that's not unusual. Now, here's what the Fed is uh, is missing, or maybe everybody's missing. When you hear these layoff announcements, people are like, well, if they're laying off, why isn't, why isn't the unemployment rate going up? Well, the answer is they have to announce the layoffs. There's all kinds of statute, you know, SEC. So if I'm going to fire 10,000 people, I got to tell the world I'm firing 10,000 people. It doesn't mean I fired them that day. I might fire them you know, on a rolling basis over the next 30 days. And it doesn't mean they walk out the door empty handed and head for the unemployment office. I might give them three months severance, six months severance, et cetera. And so when do they actually show up to the unemployment office and say, you know, give me a check? It might not be till this spring. So the layoff announcements are out there, but the unemployment rate hasn't budged because there is a lag three months. But that's why I said interest rates uh, lag the business cycle and they do. Unemployment lags the business cycle. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. When you're an employer, entrepreneur, and you're in any kind of distress, you know, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. You'll, you know, be late on the rent. You'll turn down the lights, find a cheaper laundry, whatever it takes. By the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. Like, oh, I've done everything I can. Now my business is in jeopardy. I have to fire some people. And then combine that with what I just said about severance and, you know, rolling terminations, et cetera. It's a lagging indicator. But we know enough right now to know that number's going up. But that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, um, that unemployment's a lagging indicator. So when the Fed's on a mission, they, they actually don't care about the stock market. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. 
And that's the key word. It's not if stocks are going down, but it's you know, kind of little, you know, half a percent a day, one percent a day, trending down, lower highs, lower lows, trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30 percent in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008. I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, uh, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly. That may happen. In fact, I expect it will, but, but we're not there yet. So there may be a pivot you know, in late August, but, or, you know, July thereabouts, but not because of Goldilocks, but because it's not a soft landing, it's a crash landing. So, so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal, but they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession. Now, the other half, what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers. And I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality, what's actually happening. Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then uh, there's what I call the reality. Uh, and I guess I'm the storyteller here, but um, what I see is, is a kind of a hybrid the fed's doing what they're doing right or wrong okay they're they're doing what they're doing the market has their own interpretation i agree with the market certainly the bond market that the fed has probably over tightened and they may pivot uh to say that there could be a rate cut you know rate cut in august maybe i wouldn't rule that out but for a really bad reason in other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. They over tightened and they found out too late. And then they got to, then they have to slam on the brakes if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works.